Are the leadership of the Church of England really destroying it? Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Rev Dan. I'm a vicar in the Church of England. On this channel, you'll get my views as a parish priest on the big Christian news happening at the moment. So in an article written in The Telegraph by Madeleine Grant, she says, the church leadership is destroying this Church of England I love. It goes on to say, there are two institutions, the Reverend Dr Jekyll of parish volunteers and clergy and the Reverend Mr Hyde on top. So obviously alluding there to the famous book for, by, written by Robert Louis Stevenson, Jekyll and Hyde, where the man has two different uh, c characters, two different personalities. Is it, that's really what is happening in the Church of England? Is there something more going on? I'm going to get into the article, give some of my comments about this. Uh, yes, I agree on some parts and actually on other parts uh, I don't, surprisingly enough. But let's get into the article and see what she's got to say. By the way, she doesn't hold back at all, and this is gaining a lot of traction around on the internet. For an organisation that prides itself on bringing the good news to people, you can't move for terrible headlines about the Church of England. From the Diocese of Birmingham's hunt for a deconstructing whiteness officer, to the Church of England Commissioner's report, calling for the fund of £100 million earmarked to atone for historic slavery to be increased to £1 billion. And the Church of England is getting a lot of headlines at the moment on this channel. Obviously, I, I look at the major news stories going on, what, what there is to speak into. Uh, I've been off for a couple of weeks, but there's been so many stories coming out that uh, you could do videos on across the Christian world, but a lot to do with the Church of England. Some of them actually get picked up in this article, so it's a, a good roundup for me. But the Church of England... Unfortunately, at the moment, is in the press for a, a lot of negative reasons. But on the other side, as she's saying, there's two sides uh, to, to the Church of England, uh, as she's saying here, on the parish level, there's still really, really good work going on. And it does seem that there are two different parts. But let's see what else uh, she is saying about this situation. Incidentally, the report calls for the Church of England to apologise for seeking to destroy diverse African traditional relief belief systems and replace them with Christianity. In a crowded field this might be the most insulting part. Each year thousands of Nigerian Christians are murdered by groups like Boko Haram for a faith that the report apparently gives nothing worth spreading. So I haven't read the report on this so it's a bit harder to comment because as I always say go back to the uh, original source but yes there are so many people dying in Nigeria and other countries for their Christian faith and I, I wonder what they would think in those countries about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to say and trying to apologize for something that they've laid down their lives for. Some who mistakenly view the Church of England as a unified coherent body may therefore delight in the shrinking congregations and generally low morale that defines it nowadays. I delight in none of these because I love this Church of England. So Madeleine Grant obviously attends a Church of England somewhere uh, wherever she lives and she doesn't delight in the Church of England it, it dwindling in numbers and the comfort and the morale of a clergy being low. I don't think n none of us do. What's happening in the Church of England at the moment, it, with so much going on, is heartbreaking when you are in the Church of England. We just want to thrive. We, you know, we want to get out there and do what God has called us to do. For, for first and foremost, to go and proclaim the gospel and to help people in their time of need and their times of joy you know some of these things that are happening at the moment are a distraction again on parish level there is a disconnect uh, with what's going on in the you could say the upper echelons of the church of england at parish level we are just getting on with the job of what we're called to do in the local parish that's one of the beautiful things of the church of england uh, the parochial system uh, but it seems that there is as she's uh, starting to say, and I'll get into the article a bit more to find out uh, more and elaborate on that, but a disconnect between the upper, I, and I, I keep saying upper, because Church of England is a flat structure, so a, a, a curate, a, pers a vicar in training, and, and the archbishop, uh, the archbishop is not above the curate, we are all, uh, it's on a flat structure, we're just called by God to do different jobs, and remember the archbishop was once a curate, which is a beautiful thing, you, you go through the whole of the system. So, um, but at the parochial level, it is very different at the, 
than from at the top. Look more closely though and you'll realise that there's not one Church of England but two. There's the Reverend Dr Jekyll, the one who performs invaluable work on the ground, burying the dead, visiting the sick, educating more than a quarter of our nation's school children to a much higher standard than the state normally achieves. The church manages the food banks, playgrounds, dementia cafes, loneliness workshops. It does its best to protect some of the most valuable parts of our nation's physical and cultural heritage. Its parish priests do this for little money. Its thousands of volunteers do it for none at all. And, and this is the beautiful thing, as I just said, for the local church to really engage with their local context, uh, to understand it. Each local context is very different and made up demographically different even topographically uh, very different in 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 many parts of areas we got areas of um, rural uh, ministry we've got in city ministry you know the church of england covers every inch of the land so that's what's beautiful and, and in that we respond to the need and you know things like dementia cafes loneliness workshops food banks it's a, a lot of times are initiated and volunteers go every day to help out to make sure that people get uh, to be able to get food be able to be able to speak to people have tea and coffee to speak about bereavement to speak about um, whatever you know like dementia the cafe if they're suffering from an illness this is the, the beauty of the local church and and it really is as a thank you to all the volunteers there's many many volunteers and, uh, and we say volunteers they are people who are called to serve. They are using their gifts and talents that God has given them. So they are actually serving. They're serving God's kingdom. We say volunteer. In fact, we should um, change that word because people are serving God. They're using the gift and talents. But I'll use the word volunteers now. But, you know, thank you to all the volunteers who give so much time to the church uh, to help in so, so many ways. And many of them uh, aren't recognised for how much time they give, but they do give so much time. And, and this is hugely important as for the vicars having a low morale i think uh, you know it's it, it being brought up in studies i, I mean one cohort of studies of uh, following us as we progress out of theological college and into um, ministry and in my cohort the morale and and vicar life is is a lot tougher uh, than we thought but the church of england in that sense has changed and it will change over time i never thought i would come into a, the church of england and it is how it is today you know with it being split especially over same-sex blessings and and things like that it wasn't on the radar when we we we've come in so we're adapting and changing uh as we move forward people are, are staying in the church of england there's people who are leaving the church of england over this so it wasn't the church that we first thought but you could argue that's the case uh for many uh, vicars coming in but it is sadly being reported that the morale is is low cohort has uh Covid has played a, a role in that, you know. It's, it's been a, a, a lot of work, but you know, you could argue that's, you know, that's where we are as a church. We're on that front line, helping people, and especially, especially spiritually as well. And it's going to be a, a, a hard work for a time, um, but that's 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 what we could do, right? That's that's serving people in their time of need. Then there is the other church, the Reverend Mister Hyde. This is the church of unaccountable committees and upward failure resulting in perhaps the least impressive bunch of bishops since Pope Gregory first observed, non angli said angli, and that's uh, not angels, but angles, Anglo-Saxons as it were. Rem members of this chaste speak in identical managerial jargon, which from an institution that has provided some of the most beautiful ca cadences and turns of phrase in the English language is depressing. Even more depressing is the fact that nothing they say or do gives the impression they are running the church at all, rather than an NHS trust or local council. The former post office CEO, Paula Reynolds, who, lest we forget, was reported to have been Justin Welby's choice for Bishop of London, embodies this second church. An individual with no obvious link to its parishes or grassroots work, yet catapulted into its upper echelons. So yes, this is where I think there, there is a disconnect. As I said before, you've got the local parish church responding to the needs of the context, protect, proclaiming the gospel in the parishes. And then you've got this upper, again, upper, upper, because flat structures. But another part of the church, which is the national church, the national church, and and... and those called to serve in the national church doing that job and in a way you could say look it's a, it's a big job and the church is evolving and 
has to take on some of the systems that are secular to work more efficiently. And, and some of those systems, you will make it more kind of secular because it, it just helps the work of the church. But how do you make the church work more efficiently, and, and especially with money as well and, and people's time, but still hold on to we are at the Church of Jesus Christ here to proclaim the gospel, you know, uh, uh, all the stuff that we do at the local level as well but nationally and and that's the key and this is where i think it feels as well that there is a disconnect now between the local level and the national church but also remember like between myself in my local context in my parish uh, we have our diocese you have 42 dioceses within the church of england each of those dioceses is independent of each other and will do things differently from other dioceses so things such as safeguarding can be uh, done differently uh, looking at the vocations uh, of people wanting to be called to ministry will be done differently they're they're done differently in each diocese so you've got the parish level and then you could go the diocese level and they operate differently and then you've got the national church of england um, who is one and so it does get complicated it does get very complicated because the diocese are independent of each other and yet we are the national church of england so the national church you will get clergy going into serve into that but it's a very different church to be called into a very different structure shall i say to be called into and um so you, you're of course going to get different people in there with those different gifts and talents that god's given them to to work in there but when you could lose the grassroots level of clergy going up to work into that into that organization then perhaps that's where a disconnect comes and so going back to paula reynolds who was uh, touted or said to be on the list of one of the bishop to be the bishop, the next bishop of london a few years ago and as she says that um was justin welby's choice she had never served as a, a, par- a local parish priest and so for her to go into be the Bishop of London and then not understand what it is like to run a church uh, six days a week and, and, and be a parish priest six days a week, but then become the bishop um, who is, bish- you know, the, the bishop to the clergy, they look after the clergy. And so having conversations without understanding what is going on creates instantly a disconnect take Paula Reynolds out because of all the stuff that's going on uh, with the post office. Now, there are places in the Church of England, I am sure, for people with those gifts and skills um, and their Christian faith to come into a structure where they are needed to help the Church of England flourish. But how then do we make sure that the two... The, as she says, Jekyll and Hyde, but the National Church and the local church still stay working together. You know, I think that's why it's important for people to have a faith to go to church on Sunday, uh, to see what it is like in the local church, because that's always going to be on their mind. They've got one foot in running the National Church, but they are also embedded locally uh, at a local level. I remember I worked for Sainsbury's years ago, and at Christmas, everybody in head office stopped their work and they went into a local, a local store for a week and just helped, you know, stacking shelves and serving customers and all this stuff. One, because we needed more people to help. And two, it got them out of their offices and back to what is actually the, the, the whole point of their business, the supermarkets at the front. And maybe that, that's a, a, a good thing to get people back into uh, serving into their local church for a short while to remember uh, what the local church fully does and, and, and then take that back up. So he symbolises a wider, more striking issue. Mr Hyde's contempt for the ordinary people in the pews. In Galatians, St Paul talks about the false brethren who posed as members of the church in order to bring it into bondage. I always wondered who he meant. Wonder no more. And, and, and so, I mean, strong words and strong words. And And is it because this disconnect is, is 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 just too big you know like i said she likens it to jekyll and hyde and how if we want the church to flourish and i know there's lots of stuff going on in the church but the question is is that because um 
the national church and the local church uh, uh, are now just quite far apart and how do we bring that back so the national church is now listening to what the local church says because when the national church gets into the headlines like on this channel you know it'll get into one of the christian newspapers and then it's something to speak about but it's always as i said well news getting into papers is usually negative but how do we um you know when i when i speak to people locally or people speak to me about some of these things for them it feels so disconnected from what they see in the local church you know what what's going on here and, and why is the church doing that because it doesn't feel like what's happening in the church locally it is increasingly clear that these two churches cannot both survive that this second church of england which controls all of its money runs its internal organizations manages reads stitches up appointments is doing its utmost to destroy the other one and i think she's right this this can't survive but we we are a huge organization um, the money thing would you know that's one of the biggest complaints of a local parish priest the, I think the church commission is now is it n nearly 10 billion nine definitely nine billion in investments uh, so much money and, and local churches like mine we, we run a deficit budget because we, we we have to pay a lot of money going out we have to pay our parish share uh, gas electricity insurances as well as trying to do the, the good work that we are doing and there's lots of money and it, you know I think that can be one of the biggest frustrations on the ground when we're just like we could do so much more and we you know have to make plans to in increase giving do more fundraising activities else one day as a natural thing if you've got a deficit you're going to run out of money so that disconnect coming together would be would be fantastic uh, especially to help and what limits us in one way or another is not having the money to be able to do more things as much as we would love to do and of course some of the other stuff that she's saying there i'm not going to comment on this has been going on for some time in the 1970s under the banner of fairness the church stripped parishes of their assets and centralized their funding it was claimed that this would result in a more equal church for the nation Instead, dioceses invariably use these sums to fund more diocesan officials and vanity projects, all at the expense of the parishes that provided them. Meanwhile, your average church scrabbles around in a desperate attempt to keep the roof up and the lights on. And this is true. Back in the 70s, they, the diocese took uh, the vicarages and even some church halls and, and, and took them centrally. Um, and the local church now doesn't have them as assets. I would admit um, I'm in the Diocese of Oxford and if there's a problem with my house I just send an email and it's fixed really quickly so there you know one way there is a benefit because if the church local church doesn't have money and the vicarage is falling down it, it's going to be really hard to uh, fund those repairs and some repairs when things go wrong obviously like in any house can be quite expensive so that is a benefit uh, we, we, the house is always kept um, up to a safe standard or all those checks are done and if anything breaks it works but on the downside is you know diocese have in the past if they've got an old rectory and i'm in, in one and in my previous place i was in one as well if got an old rectory with a big ground they would sell the old rectory and build a new rectory but that money um sometimes it went a bit went to the parish but sometimes i, I think not and it would go to the diocese and it was the local church at one point usually uh that built that house and it was sold and then um that they haven't got the money today you know there, there are some churches that now don't have that the rectory or the vicarage i'm in a rectory that's why i say rectory and perhaps they don't have a vicar if they did own that and they said look we're, we're one of a team of churches of six we, we don't need our vicarage uh, we could either rent it out we, or we could sell it and raise funds for the church that's not an option anymore and so the church local churches don't have any assets anymore the institution owes its experience to the unpaid appreciated labor or parochial church council members church wardens and congregants many buildings wouldn't survive at all without charities such as friends of the friendless churches which supports more than 60 abandoned places of worship across england and wales 
And again, that's true. I got a friends of Chalfont St. Giles Parish Church, which is my church, and these friends, they raise money and they put on events and concerts to help raise money to look after the church building, the fabric of the church. And and that's a good thing to to ha- keep the church, you know, safe. Uh, any problems that come up, we can get them fixed. Um, and, and, and they are great to do that. Uh, and also from my point of view, it saves the church money because they contribute half, we pay half. Um, to be able to not just spend all our money on maintaining the church building. So these charities are absolutely fantastic um, they love the church luckily, luckily I'm in a very beautiful church and they they want to pres- preserve it for the future and so it also helps our church uh, to save money to be able to do other things or uh, pay the bills in the face of this Church of England PLC is invariably stingy its long running refrain to parishes up and down the country is if you want a vicar you've got to pay for it yourself which naturally favours wealthier areas over poorer ones so this Part is not the Church of England as a whole. This comes down to local diocese and how local diocese will fund their vicars. Now, diocese, they like churches, they've got money coming in, they've got money going out. But yes, um, there are places that will say, if you can't fund your vicar, you get what you pay for. So if you can only fund half a vicar, the next, when the present vicar leaves, the next time you're only going to get half because you're not paying enough. And that isn't topped up. That does come down to a bit of how well the finances of the diocese are doing. But to be honest, vicars are the, the front line. We're on the coal face. It is without the vicars, how do we minister to people? How do we present the gospel to people? And people come to know Jesus. And, and through that, people then tithing and giving, you know. So you need vicars. Uh, and, and a report and an antidote to evidence uh, back in 2012 said one vicar to one parish and there's ch- church growth anything bigger than that and, and, and it's and as you can imagine it's naturally struggled to get round to so many churches and and to do all that pastoral work and also go out there and, and, and proclaim the gospel but different dioceses are looking at this in different ways one of my pushbacks on this is you know, what if you have a, an area that's, say, got uh, 10,000 people and it's got, like, two Church of England schools, it's got, like, three nursing homes, but the church has, has, has shrunk over size in congregants uh, over the years and when they get a new vicar, they say, all you can do is afford half time. But the context is, you know, you've got two schools to go into, nursing homes to visit, 10,000 people, it's a great opportunity, but you only got a half-time vicar working like four days a week, three days perhaps, but more likely four days a week. And then you got in another parish uh, where you've got 5,000 people, like no church in the schools, no nursing homes, uh, um, but they can afford a full-time vicar that, you know, and they get a full-time vicar because then they can afford it, but there's less pastoral work, there's less people there you know and less no time to go to school so it's kind of great for the vicar to be able to go out but context is what i'm saying context is king and so fund the area with twice as many people and and the potential of schools schools work is absolutely great and and the nursing homes ministry as well and not base it on if a local church could pay base it on the potential as well or look at the potential and if you get the right vicar there because the previous vicar might not have done anything and that's why the church has declined but if you get the right vicar there pay full time because the potential the context says that but to go straight down the line if you can't pay for it as a local church it doesn't matter about the context that's what you get that's 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 really it. again that that's not good that's not church of england plc um as she says uh, the national church that is diocese but the church of england with all the money could help fund uh churches uh, the, on the front line which is why developments like the search for a deconstructed whiteness officer to join an 11 person west millions racial justice team are particularly grating not only does this directly contradict christian teaching that we are the children of god made in his image there is the sheer cost of it Having claimed poverty, suddenly the Church of England is awash for, with cash for nonsense jobs. Nor will find a hundred million down the back of the ecclesiastical sofa to devote to reparatory justice and dear the C of E to its hard-pressed congregants. So we no doubt imagine that 
embracing radical thinking will attract younger worshippers. The Bishop of Dudley recently boasted to the General Synod that every parish representative in his diocese must now undergo compulsory and conscious bias training. So there are a few things there. You know, the money that they are spending on this uh, racial justice team, 11-person team, minimum earner there, £36,000. They're doing it over three years. There's going to be more people earning. Uh, and one of them deconstructing whiteness officer. You know, we're, we're here to, as we said before, proclaim the gospel, help people. We are Christians, you know, we should not be racist at all in the church. And, and if we are, then we have to question where our faith is in God. We are called not to see different colours, uh, ethnicities. We we see each other as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And every and when people don't believe in God, we, we see them as made in the image of God. You know, where are we as a church when we are spending so much money on this we, we've got to come back to the teachings of the bible and make sure that is taught and, and that we're living that out um you know the hundred million for reparatory justice is uh, a, a very controversial in the church you know how does that work and how can it's not spending a hundred million it's putting it in an account uh, but again like i have no problem with you putting a hundred million in an account or a billion in an account but uh, for this it you know, I don't know how it works, but put a billion in an account and earn the interest and go to the most needy areas that really need help and, and, and use it for the good of the community. Build playgrounds, help uh, refurbish schools or libraries or something that will bring a benefit to those people who are most in need. I'm, I'm absolutely all for that. Uh, this is, is just controversial. And again, as you're saying, at the local level, People just aren't understanding what is going on, and I hear that. Uh, as for uh, unconscious bias training, again, um, you know, everybody, everybody, parish representative in the diocese uh, within Dudley is going to um, undergo that. You know, volunteers are so busy, and so many people don't agree with this as well. So, what what are they going to do? Are they going to say, "You're telling me to do it"? Well. I walk then I walk I don't want to do this I don't believe in this you know we can't force upon people uh, something that they they don't believe in and especially saying as Christians as Christians we're called not to believe in this because on to say with this more likely it will irritate the dwindling number of volunteers who sustain the church and further demoralize clergy who depart from this way of thinking and uh, you know and I think that's absolutely true we don't need more people walking away from the church but this is part of the cause. So much for the hierarchy's language and decision making seems to be designed to alienate. Robert Conquest famously noted that the simplest way to explain the behaviour of any bureaucratic organisation is to assume that it is controlled by a cable of its enemies. Nowhere is this truer than in the Church of England. You know, and, and, and she's saying this because she is frustrated uh, by the Church of England. She's just frustrated by this disconnect. And, you know, this is why I think this article is gaining a lot of traction. People who agree, people won't agree. Some, like me, will agree on parts and not on others. But I think what it is highlighting, and this is an important part, is not just to dismiss it, but actually saying, is there a disconnect uh, between the local parish level and the national church? How can we bring this back? How we, can we align ourselves together? And I know there's a lot more going on. You know, we talk about parish level, but we know that we're divided at parish level as well over other things. Um, but how do we, uh, in this instance bring the local parish level and the national church aligned in what we are called to do.